this bush is burning. These people, one day they'll be arrested or they've already been arrested. He could have dismissed a supernatural act or event as a natural act or event. Hallelujah. We have seen people who will be looking at other people when they are in the, under the anointing. They are just looking. Hallelujah. There is a certain man in Gwanda. When the scripture union kids, students, were busy having their prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit began to move. And as the Holy Spirit began to move, they started to cry. Some they started to cry. Some they started to groan in the spirit. Others were speaking in tongues. And this, this grown-up man was busy writing some of the things which they were speaking. He was busy trying to write some of the words which they were speaking. <laughs> the man is in a place where God is moving, but he can't feel God because he's not forecast. Hallelujah. He was looking at a supernatural event as a natural event. Hallelujah. Say, don't look at supernatural things as natural things. <clears throat> because in life you can confuse supernatural things from natural things. Because prayer is done through talking, it doesn't mean that prayer is talking. It is warfare. Say, it is warfare. Because declarations are done through talking, it doesn't mean that we are talking when we are making declarations. We are doing warfare. Say we are doing warfare. Yes, even when people are singing. I know some of you, you may be wondering, why is it in many churches when the devil wants to attack a church, if he fails to cause the pastor to fall, his next target is usually the present worship team. Because when you open your mouth to sing the praises of Zion or the praises of God, you'll be doing spiritual warfare. A lot of people don't realize that when you are singing as a worship, you will be actually doing warfare. It's even worse with, the, with praise and worship. Because praise and worship was foreordained by God to harness the presence of God. So when you are in praise and worship, what you need is a very strong prayer life. But my personal experience is that uh, many present worshippers are not prayerful. There are very few present worshippers who are actually prayerful. And by being prayerful, I mean a consistent prayer life. I'm not talking about a msundulo type of prayer life. That w this person is consistent for three weeks, and then after three weeks when they get offended by something, they stop praying. I'm not talking about the msundulo kind of prayer life. This Tai Tai kind of prayer life. The dragonfly kind of prayer life. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm talking about a prayer life where you pray even when you, where you pray when you feel like praying. Where you pray when you feel as if you are on cloud 9 or cloud 18. Where you pray even when you don't feel like praying. Where you pray even when you are sick. Where you pray even when your voice is gone. Where you pray with or without a voice. Where you pray when your friends are around you. Where you pray even when your friends have deserted you. Where you pray when it is cold. Where you pray even during some. Where when you are told by the Holy Spirit to pray at 12 o'clock. Even when it is very cold and it's windy outside or it's drizzling outside or it's raining outside, you wake up from your blankets and you go and pray. That's the kind of life which is necessary for you to stand in praise and worship there. Otherwise, when, when I am doing this pulpit ministry, this altar ministry, this ministry of the altar, I am moving in the altar, I'm singing. I am moving in the altar, I'm singing. I'm announcing to the elements in the atmosphere, to demons, that I've arrived as someone who is coordinating the activities of God. And the devil will say, oh, all right, you have come to coordinate the activities of God. Let me press this button and see whether you realize that it's me who is pressing this button. So you need to be focused and you need to know. Let me put it this way. Any person who has got a certain office which they occupy in the household of God, they are involved in spiritual warfare. Any person, even if you are an usher in church, 
But of course, some offices are more visible than others. Like what I'm doing. What I'm doing, you get a lot of attacks. Hallelujah. You get so many attacks. But you have to be focused. To say you have to be focused. You have to know that you are a spiritual warrior. Say I'm a spiritual warrior. Hallelujah. Say I'm a spiritual warrior. So Moses was quite focused. That's why he was able to take the people of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. Of course, it's Joshua who crossed over to the promised land. I want us to check something. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn? If you see something in the realms of the spirit, you have to be focused. They say you have to be focused. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him. When does God call to Moses? He calls to Moses after Moses has responded to spiritual revelation. Unless and until you respond to spiritual revelation, God will not respond back to you. For God to speak into your life, you have to act on what God has already spoken. Hallelujah. For God to move in your life, you have to move on the basis of what God has already done to show you that he is moving. And it may not be easy. It was not easy for Jesus Christ. When he preached this first sermon, they, they almost threw him, I mean, on the cliff. They took him by force. They say, this man is a carpenter's son. He's now pretending to be a prophet. He's saying, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Blah, blah, blah. He was never a student of the Pharisees. Let us take him and throw him on the cliff. And then we'll bury him after he has died. And then the Bible says Jesus just turned and moved in between them and left Nazareth. He left Nazareth to go and preach elsewhere. Not only in the wilderness, but even when he started his ministry, he was attacked. They wanted to kill him. There was a day when they wanted to stone him and he had to hide somewhere in the temple. They were carrying stones. They wanted to kill him with stones because of the sermon that he was preaching. But because Jesus knew that he was supposed to die on the cross, he didn't allow himself to die anyhow. Hallelujah. He was focused. For you to, to get the benefits that you desire from God, you need to act on what God has already provided. Hallelujah. That's how you see the move of God. That's how we see the move of God. When you see God doing something in, the, in his word and in your life, you need to move on the basis of what God has done in his word. Hallelujah. I want you to pray and say, Oh Lord, May you give me the intuition of Moses who was able to move when you spoke through the burning bush. Because God speaks in many ways. Sometimes he speaks through sight, through the things that you are able to see. Sometimes he speaks through events in your life. Sometimes he speaks through a sermon. When a message is being shared like this. Hallelujah. There are some people uh, who say, you know I've been praying for this thing and God has not answered me. What if it doesn't need prayer? It needs you to make a declaration. I want you to tell your neighbor and say, he has come with a revelation. Yes, because there are some things which don't need prayer. You will see very shortly. I don't have time. I don't have a lot of time. Verse 4. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. 
And he said, here I am. Do you realize that Moses is a very sensitive person? He doesn't say ah, these things. They've just started again. I left Egypt. Is this, is this a person maybe who is sitting on top of a tree? Who is perched on top of a tree? Who is now looking for me for the crime which I did 40 years ago? No. He responded. He said, here yeah, I am. Say, here yeah, I am. Today I'm here to tell you as your brother in Christ and also as a man of God that God is calling you. He is calling you. I don't know what he is calling you to, but God is calling you. Look at your neighbor and say, God is calling you. Say, God is calling you. Say, Jesus is calling you. I want you to say, here am I, O Lord. Say, here I am. O Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's how you respond to God. When you respond to God, then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Say holy ground. Now, why didn't God start by telling Moses that take off your sandals when Moses was not concentrating? Because God likes to talk to someone who is focused on him. God wants exclusive focus. If we are to give this message a title, we can give it the title, Be Focused on God When Praying. Look at your neighbor and say, Be Focused on God When Praying. Yes. I've got a cell phone. I had phones making noise. I heard phones making noise. Now, my phone is off. The reason why it is off is because I want to be focused on God when I'm doing his work. I don't want to be doing the work of God and then the phone is disturbing me. Otherwise, what I'm doing for God, I will end up doing it alone. Hallelujah. Maybe you think you were praying, maybe you were not praying, you were just playing. Because there is a, a thin line which the markets praying and playing. It is the letter in between P and A. Hallelujah. <laughs> when you have a city at Tandas, that is Dalila Manjuan. You'll be thinking you are praying, yet you are playing. Look at your neighbor and ask them. In your life, are you praying or playing? Look at them again and say, in your life, are you praying or playing? People know me when they come at home, when I am still praying. I can only respond to you when I'm just about to finish the prayer. If I'm far away from finishing the prayer, I act as if there is no one, because there is no one who is like God, as far as I'm concerned. There is no one like God. Say, there is no one like God. So uh, when I'm in the presence of God, I'm in the presence of God. Even if someone who is, whom I last saw 20 years ago comes, I will not abandon my prayer on the strength of what I'm hearing in the flesh. I will ignore that person. Hallelujah. I will ignore that person because I am focused on God. Look at your neighbor and say, be focused on God when praying. Yes, that's the title of the message. So, all the prayers that you have prayed in your life, ever since you started praying, who or what were you focusing on? Because when studying, you are at school there, but instead of focusing on books, you are busy looking for friends, looking for girlfriends and boyfriends, looking for banjo, looking for beer. Can you come up with any, any A's there? 
or any good symbols. I'm a teacher. I've seen people who had 15 points failing to graduate, finally being chunked out of the university. Because even though they were intelligent, they lacked focus. I've seen a lot of students who are not very intelligent, but who are highly focused. With their lack of intelligence, but because this person is focused, they'll be working so hard until they get the degree. And then, because the person is focused, later on in life, when they are applying for a job, and they get a job they're highly likely to impress, they become branch managers of banks or companies. Why? Because they are focused. When they are given a job, that clean this chair. May I have a cloth or something? That clean this chair. That clean this chair. They will, focus to, they will be focused on cleaning the chair. Hallelujah. They will be focused on cleaning the chair. They can't be cleaning the chair and then, ah, we could not last a week. Ah, I'm going to, then they leave the chair before they finish cleaning it. And then you think you can be a branch manager of my organization. You have to be focused. Look at your neighbor and say, be focused. Because for Jesus Christ, here I have to tread very carefully. I'm using the word qualify figuratively or metaphorically, which means to move from one stage to another. Hallelujah. For Jesus Christ to qualify to be a savior in his natural life, we know he was already qualified by predestination. But to, to graduate from being just a natural human being to a savior, he had to be focused as a carpenter's son. You know the statement which is translated carpenter's son in the New Testament it can also mean an, a carpenter's apprentice. It means Jesus Christ had apprenticed in the workshop of Joseph. And he knew how to measure exactly the dimensions of a, of a tap or of a bench. That the bench has to have these dimensions. No plank should overlap. The nails have to fit this way. I have to knit, hit the nails with so much pressure. Because if I hit the nails like I am hitting a pep, the nails will never go in. Say the nails will never go in. Say the nails will never go in. Yes. And then if you take pressure as if you are a cold partner who is hitting a rock again, the plank will break into pieces. So you have to measure the force that you apply on the plank. And you can only do that if you are focused. And some of the things, if you are a carpenter, some of the nails that you will be hitting into the plank, you have to hold them. So if you are busy talking to your friend, that will last. You will hit your hand. Say you will hit your hand. The hands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ could have been injured before he started praying for people, if he was not focused. The reason why his hands were only injured when he was crucified is because he was focused. Say he was focused. Say he was focused. Look at your neighbor and say, are you focused? Because one, one common characteristic of, among people who don't achieve anything in life that I've seen is that they are not focused. One common characteristic, one may speak Chinese, another one Sutu, another one Debele, another one Nambia, another one Tonga, and so on. Another one may speak in tongues. Hallelujah. <laughs> but one common characteristic characteristic of people to never achieve anything is that they are not focused. The revelation that God is giving us from Moses is that Moses was a focused man. That's why Moses was able to write the Ten Commandments. In fact, he's not the one who wrote them. He was able, because he waited for 40 days in order to receive the tablets of stone, which are the Ten Commandments. Just imagine, the commandments were not even fought. Say the commandments were not even fought. They were just ten. They needed, if a commandment was to be written in a day, they only need, he only needed to wait for ten days, but he waited for 40 days, which means on average, if I do my mathematics, 
If I say 40 divided by 10, it means he was waiting on average four days for a commandment. And those commandments, if you read them from Exodus chapter 20, they are very short. Say they are very short. They are even shorter in Hebrew. In Hebrew, they are even shorter. The sentences are long in English, Debele, Shona, and other languages. In Hebrew, they are even shorter. But he needed to wait on average four days. Just waiting in the presence of God. And there was no one. Just, just imagine, he was sleeping in the cloud. He just forgot about what? He forgot about the need for a blanket. He forgot about food. In courts, he forgot about his wife. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To receive the commandments. That's the kind of exclusive devotion that you need in order to receive from God. If you want to receive from God and then you, your mind is afraid. JMCC, when they are dancing, they'll be wearing some things. If I do this, they will say, pff, pff, you know. if your mind is like that, you can't receive anything from God. Because God wants ex exclusive devotion from an exclusively focused mind. Say exclusive devotion. From an exclusively focused mind. Yes, we have diagnosed one of the main problems, why your prayers are not getting any answers and why your declarations are empty in the realms of the spirit. They are not empty though. They provoke a lot of demons. That's why ever since you became a Christian believer, you seem to be having more problems than answers. Well, some of the people who have attended these meetings who are not attending them, especially they don't see any results. But the reason why they can't see any results is because they are not focused. If you are focused, God never disappoints someone who is focused. You will never disappoint someone who is focused on him. If you focus on God, you will never disappoint your focus. The key ingredient when you are praying, before you even pray, is to focus on God. And what helps us to focus on God is the word of God. It is the prism or the spiritual binocular that you use to focus on God. Because God is a spirit. And the God, the spirit, dwells in his word. Say God, the spirit, dwells in his word. Let us assume your husband is in America. Your husband is in America. How do you focus on your husband? Because you can't focus on your husband who is in America physically. Your sight is only limited to a few meters. Even someone who is in Louvre, you can't see them. But they will be here within Bulawan. So, someone who is focused on their husband who is in America, you will always see them. Bichana, bichana, you will always see them on the phone. Hallelujah. You will see, and then you will even comment to yourself that, hey, you are so focused on your husband who is in America. But how can that be? Because the husband is not there physically. Because this person is always following the messages from the husband. They are always dialoguing with the husband. So even if God is not physically here on earth, you have to focus on his message. And this message is freely available. It's now even in the phones. It is the Bible. When you focus on the message, because God will always do something to check on what you are focused. There are things that God will never do through you unless you are focused on him. There are things which God desires to do through us as a fellowship, but he will never do them through us until we give him that exclusive focus and devotion. There are things that God desires to do through you, which he will never do through you unless you are focused. God will do something, and then you will see whether you are focusing on it. That's how the devil also operates. The devil comes.
in front of you. You say, ah, this prey, this peck is just falling. And even in the meantime, the devil is somewhere there near the camera. Hey, this bank has just fallen. And then because you are focusing on the bank. And then, ah, this thing has also fallen. And then the devil will pick another thing. You have lost the direction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today I'm teaching practical. Say he is teaching practical. I'm not preaching, I'm teaching practical the importance of focus. The ingredient which Bill Gates has, which a lot of Christians do not have, is that he is focused. The man has been doing software ever since he was less than 10 years. When he was 15 years, he wrote software to control traffic in a city which is called Seattle in, in the United States of America, in the state of Washington. There is Washington, D.C., the capital city, and then there is the state of Washington. In the state of Washington, the capital, the state capital of the state of Washington is called Seattle. In that city, it's a, it's a city which is bigger than Ulawa in the United States of America. They're near California. He, he, he produced a software when he was 15 years old, which, which was used to regulate traffic. 15 years old. He was born in 1955. So it means it was around 1970 when he produced that software. And then 1974, they started Microsoft with his friend, Paul Allen. And he has been fo f focused on that up to, t up to date. He has now retired from Microsoft, but he has got a, I mean a position of advising the executives at Microsoft. Then. And because he was focused, now Microsoft is a colossal company and is the richest man on earth. You don't just become a richest man on earth because God has blessed you with the anointing. Some of us have got the anointing, but we don't have a way of focusing the anointing. And then there are some people without the anointing, but who are focused. Hallelujah. Who are focused. Look at the rate at which Muslims are building mosques. Are they using the anointing? No, they are just using focus. They've got a focus that in a city we want to have 20 mosques. If a city has got this population, they divide the population by the number of mosques that they want to have. They sit in a meeting, they come up with that goal, they come up with a time plan, a timeline as to when they want to achieve that, and then they move on to achieve that. If you are focused, it will force you to be time sensitive. But if you are not focused, you will waste a lot of time. When your friend arrives at home, you will start to go away with your friend, and then you spend two hours. I can't spend two hours with a friend. Because when I'm spending two hour, hours, when will I read for my PhD? When will I pray? When will I prepare for the sermon? When will I finish marking my scripts? When will I read the pipe? Because if, if I donate two hours to you, there are some people who have desired to visit me over the past three months. And I've told them, I, you can't visit me. I am busy for the next three months. Not because I'm arrogant. I'll be literally busy even when I'm sleeping. I'll be busy sleeping so that I can wake up and work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus Christ was not just available to anyone. He was available 24-7 to the 12 apostles. Some people, they only saw Jesus once. People like Luke, they just heard in Ngane one. with ah, why con? You look why busy surgery. He was busy as a physician, fixing people's bodies. Yet Jesus was there. He only started to appreciate the importance of Jesus when he had left. Hallelujah. Say, are you focused on God? Yes, that's what we are learning from Moses. For Moses to become the Moses that we are reading about today, so many thousands of years afterwards, it's because he was focused on God. Say, it's not entirely up to God. And certainly it's not entirely up to you. 
I want you to confess again. Say it's not entirely up to God. And certainly it's not entirely up to you. What does it mean? It means you and God, we, you must meet at a certain point. But for you and God to meet at a certain point, you must focus on each other. God has got no pro problem on focusing on you because his eyes are everywhere. He has got eyes even as poon. 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 But you, the, your challenge now is that if you focus on WhatsApp, if you focus on WhatsApp, you are no longer focusing on God. If they say on WhatsApp, hey, chinos, chinos, hey, this has happened, you will start to kick, 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 instead of praying. Instead of enjoying the presence of God, you will find yourself giggling in the presence of God. Not because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but because you have lost your focus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's the message that God. Because some people may be wondering, how does this man flow into the word of knowledge? When he is standing before people, how does he know in the first place that today he must speak to people. Because sometimes I don't even pray for people. I tell people, I know I will pray for you on Sunday. It means as I'm talking to you, I am focused on someone. I am focused on God. Say, be focused on God. When you come into the presence of God, it's a place where you don't need to focus on your problems. You can mention them. But don't focus on your problems. My time is almost up. Let me summarize. But I want you to go and read Exodus chapter 1 up to 3. The calling of Moses. Actually up to 4. Let us go to chapter 4. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me. Or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to, to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. Look at your neighbor and say, What is in your hand? Say, What is in your hand? Yes, before God uses what you do not have, He starts by using what you have. Look at your neighbor and say, What do you have for God? No, I'm not necessarily talking about something which is in your hand physical. I am talking about gifts which God has given you. Hallelujah. Peter had a pot. And he learned, he learned that pot to Jesus when Jesus Christ was having a crusade. And when Jesus had finished ministering the gospel from the port of Peter. He ministered back to Peter. He used what Peter had to perform a miracle for Peter. The fish that didn't just jump out of the water into Peter, Peter's content. I mean, God starts from where you are. Say, God starts from where you are. Yes. For God to use you, you have to, you have to be available to be used in terms of what you already have spiritually. Hallelujah. Let us clap hands for God. Hallelujah. 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 Let us read my last script, which is Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. It says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So, the word of your testimony or your confession is powerful in overcoming the devil. Let us stand up in the presence of God.